So, good evening everyone. My name is Director Francis. I'm Director of Education at the Monshire, and I and the Monshire are so glad that you are all here. And we are also extremely appreciative to Barbara McGilroy and the um, Biodiversity Committee, which is a subcommittee of the Hanover Conservation Commission, for all their work and effort in putting together the series. As many of you may know, if you haven't, I'm sure there is a list in the back. This is the first of nine different events that are happening this year. Um, here at the Monshire and up at Bradford, they're happening all over the place uh, that the Biodiversity has put together uh, focusing on pollinators. Um, before we do get to that, though, uh, and before I pass on the mic to Barbara and Kent and Sarah and Taylor, um, I'm going to take advantage of being up here and just make sure you're aware of where you are at the Montshire Museum um, here in Norwich and what we, else we have going on. Um, this is like a really super busy time of year right now. So um, tomorrow night, for those of you that are looking for an excuse to come and play with exhibits and science and have a great local beer from Norwich Inn, is our adult evening, Montshire Unleashed. That begins at 6 to 9 tomorrow night. It's really fun and it's nice to be here without kids. Um, and then, let's see, and then also on Monday night, uh, we have a program that's been put together with a, a group that's focusing, or, or they have a special guest coming in from Slovakia, um, about, um, about rain and precipitation and weather patterns and climate and the role of, of uh, the water cycle on, on climate and on a healthy ecosystem. So that's Monday night. On Tuesday night, for those of you that are Monshire groupies, you know that we have a uh, brand spanking new exhibit we spent several years prototyping and developing called Making Music. That's upstairs on the second floor, and we'll be having our second of four lectures on music and the brain. Tuesday night's lecture will be with uh, Dr. Chris Jernstead, who's a researcher at the college at Dartmouth, and he'll be talking about what happens to the brain and in the brain when we actually hear music and, and how music helps us be one of the best storytellers. Uh, the following week, for those of you that are teachers or are connected to teachers and educators, uh, we'll be launching a week-long series of webinars, professional development webinars on how to incorporate engineering into your science. And then finally, um, on the last Saturday of March, we'll be having two professional steel drum musicians upstairs in the Making Music exhibit, and they will be um, making music. So, so all that information and more you can find out on our website. Um, and again, I want to thank you for coming, and um, I'm going to pass on the mic to Barbara. Okay. So you've already heard about the Biodiversity Committee, but uh, we brought in a whole lot of other people helping in one way or another. I, it's more than 25 people that help with planting seeds. And here, and here. Speak up. I, yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, I have had the help in organizing this series from more than 25 people. If, you, if some people have helped plant the seeds up in the college greenhouse so that we could get them out to the schools, we've got I think now 12 schools and 7 school districts are growing pollinator plants. Um, the, uh, the, the way this evolved was last year in March, the Grantham Garden Club and Eastman uh, Sustainability Group had a two-day event in Grantham about pollinators. And, and that led to four pollinator gardens in Grantham. And we thought that was really inspiring. So J.D. Clark from that who uh, led that effort came to help us get organized, and from that um, we started planning. And then there was another person I want to thank, and that's Sarah Zahandra. She was so generous with her time, and she said, "Well, what's your goal?" And so I brought that back to the, the planning group, and we decided we have a goal of 100 new pollinator gardens in the Upper Valley this year. So that's how we thought, oh, we better talk to the schools or get the schools involved. The other person, besides uh, J.D. Clark and Sarah, who's up here I'm going to speak, was um, Greg DeFrancis. I had a, when we were just getting started, 
he pushed as well and said, well, the Monkshire can have a family events day all about insects and pollinators in particular. And so that's happening in July. So one thing led to another, and, um, and it's, it's really exciting to, the enthusiasm with which the whole idea is being met and people are getting busy doing their own thing. So now I'm going to turn the meeting over to David Hurt from the biology department, who's going to be moderating this and he'll introduce the speakers and then they'll speak. Not Okay, well, <clears throat> welcome everybody. And uh, before I introduce the speakers, I'd just like to, it just struck me looking around at the faces here and then hearing Barbara speak. Uh, you know, if you watch the evening news or read the papers, uh, especially these days, you get a certain impression about what drives the world and what makes people tick. Can you hear me in the back? No. Yeah. Yeah. If you keep track of the news, and maybe especially recently, you get a certain feeling about what makes the world go around. And uh, events like this and work like people here are doing, um, we've got Bob's organizing, the work that Greg and all the Monshire folks do, what all of the partners are doing with this pollinator project, uh, all the hard work uh, making things happen, and in the science figuring out how things work so that we know better how to make things happen. Uh, and there's not much fame or wealth or power in any of that. Uh, you don't see it on the news, but it's happening all the time. It's happening right here with all of you guys. And so maybe if you could just put your hands together to in appreciation for yourselves and for all of the work that everybody else is doing. Uh, just a feeling of solidarity about that. Okay, so we're going to have uh, two half-hour sessions uh, of presentations, uh, and the second one will be split by two of the two of the speakers, and I'll introduce uh, those uh, in a moment. Um, and then after that, we'll hope to have maybe close to half an hour uh, for you guys if you can stay around to have some interaction with the speakers and have some questions um, and, and discussion. So that's a really important part. So try to try to stay around for that part too. So uh, our first speaker is Taylor Ricketts. He's a professor of environment and natural resources at the Rubenstein School at the University of Vermont. He's also director of the Gond Institute, an institute of ecological economics. Uh, he was kind of homegrown in part because he did his undergraduate work here at Dartmouth uh, in the geology department. Is Gary Johnson here? Yep. His advisor uh, in earth sciences. And uh, how are you doing, Gary? And uh, then went on to do his PhD at Stanford, and uh, then uh, to the World Wildlife Fund, where he directed the Conservation Science Program for a decade or so, uh, and before coming to the pond. So, yeah. Okay. That doesn't sound so great. I'm going to take your microphone. Turn the mic off and you pull it out. Yeah. Yeah. There's trouble with them. Okay. Yeah. That didn't. That didn't. This one's still off. How's that? Good. Everybody awake now? Okay. So yeah, I um, I love the fact that I now have. 90 minutes from here. I used to live much, much further away from Dartmouth. Um, and it's really fun coming back here. I feel like I have a real connection here. I have uh, old professors that are here, not old, but you know, my <laughs> professors uh, here. And uh, I have a niece now who's a first year student at Dartmouth. I have family friends and family in the Upper Valley, so it's really fun to be able to just sit down here. I was just here at my 25th reunion myself last summer, so time flies, but the connection is still there. <clears throat> so, uh, the three of us are going to kind of team up to cover a lot of ground about pollinators and kind of piece me away. My job is to talk about the importance of pollinators locally, nationally, and globally. Why we should care about pollinators um, and what's happening to them and why that should matter to all of us, whether you're naturalists or not. Um, and then sprinkle in there between all three talks is going to be a little bit about what the pollinators are here, 
what the trends are, how we know that information, and what people can do to, to uh, help pollinators in their gardens or their farms or their towns or whatever. Okay? So, ready. Okay, so I think it's clear that pollinators are having a bit of a moment right now. So they're becoming the themes of series like this, but they're also becoming really top of mind at lots of different uh, levels. So uh, uh, President Obama, actually, one of his presidential memos, which are now being made quite famous, one of his was directing his entire government to, um, within a year, tell him how they're all going to help um, conserve pollinators nationally. And that plan is pretty embedded in a lot of these agencies. Um, it's not just a sort of presidential level thing. That, by the way, is the closest we ever got to photographing him with some pollinating theme. So magnolias are these fantastic pollination stories. They're beetle pollinated because they evolved before bees did. Anyway, so we caught him with a flowering plant. Okay, um, Vermont right here was the first, one of the first states to list uh, a bee as an endangered species. One of three was listed last year. This one now, a finis, Bombus of finis, is um, uh, almost listed nationally. Uh, one of the, you know, the first sort of uh, important that these crop pollinators would be so. And then internationally, there's this big UN sponsored, funded, sanctioned assessment of the world's ecosystems and the things they do for us, the benefits they provide to people. And the very first theme to come out of this UN sanctioned five year effort was pollinators. 128 countries agreed. We want to know about pollinators first. So it's just, for someone like me who works on this stuff, it's a great time to be alive because there's this focus on it now. So I think there are three reasons for this sort of arrival of pollination and that issue. One is pollinators are really important, and David talked about the science being important and helping us understand these issues. We're understanding really quickly now how important pollinators are to lots of aspects of our lives. Secondly, they're declining, and we know that um, from what we know about a lot of pollinators, there are a lot of species we know nothing about, um, but the ones we do know enough about, most of them are uh, in trouble, at least in parts of their ranges. So they're important, they're in trouble, and we can do something about it. And this is what distinguishes this problem from lots of other ones that make the headlines, like climate change and other things that seem intractable and global cooperation required. All of us can do really important things for bees. It's not a mystery what they need, and it's not a mystery how to do that. So, it's a nice combination of a, a big important issue that's currently a problem that we can fix in the near term with local action. Okay, so my job is that first one. So this is a nutshell of what pollination is. If you can read the small writing, I'm sorry. This is just a flower, it's like a wonderful uh, New Yorker cartoon. And there's a flower, and there's a bee coming in saying food, and there's a flower sitting there saying sex. This is the mutualism that is pollination. It's animals and plants each doing something for each other. The animals are helping the flowers reproduce, moving pollen around to um, create more flowers, more plants, and they're getting a reward for that in the form of nectar and pollen. Right? So there's a mutualism in nature. Here's a more serious treatment of that. So essentially what pollinators are doing is they're moving pollen from the male parts of the, fam the flowers to a different individual's female parts, and moving that to fertilization like um, uh, lots of plants and animals do, right? So that's the act of um, <coughs> reproduction in flowering plants. And bees and butterflies and moths and bats and birds and lots of other things do it. Pretty much 80% of plants on Earth require this. So no pollinators, no green planet, no flowering plants or angiosperms. They've co-evolved to make the world a green place. So ecologically, just fundamentally, pollinators are as important um, as anything to keeping the world the way it looks um, on the land at least, okay? So this has co-evolved over thousands and millions of years. This is a famous story about um, an orchid discovered by Darwin um, on one of his travels around the world, and that orchid had a tube about this long, about a foot long, and he said, I didn't find it, but I'm predicting that someone will find in this forest a moth or some insect with a tongue this long as well. That's the only reason that flower would have evolved such a tube to get down to the reward. is to specialize on an insect or a bird or something, he thought, that could do that. And about 150 late years later, we found the moth, and that's it, right? So that's a, this really ancient mutualism of co-evolution that's still really handy today. Um, a lot of these are apples. 
a lot of our food plants now require pollination, so it's this ancient interaction that gives us our food supply, or much of it, even today. Okay, so I teach now, so I love giving quizzes. So here's your first. There's going to be three. First is, what percentage of the most important global crops benefit from animal pollination? So there's about 100 or so of the most economically important crops traded globally, and I want to know what percentage of them benefit from, do better, or do or produce at all with animal pollination. So there's going to be a series of holding up your hands. Who thinks it's 30% at least? No, 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 not at least. 30. Whose guess is 30? See, I'm new to this professor thing. 30, no, okay. 50%, half the plants, 70% of plants, crop plants that is, 90%, yeah, 100%, yeah, okay, so it's about 70, so you guys were even thinking it was more important than it was, so, so these are about 70% of crop plants um, require, or require or benefit from um, animal pollination, okay, let's go on. Which of the following does not benefit from animal pollination? Which of these crops is one of those 30% instead of one of those 70? Okay, I'll give you a second to mull your options. All right, who thinks it's cacao, chocolate? Does not require pollination, okay? Who thinks it's apples? Coffee, grapes, blueberries. Okay, some, lots of you didn't vote. <laughs> It's grapes. The answer is grapes. Everything else requires pollination. Cacao is an obligate on this little thrip, this tiny little... <coughs> okay, so everything else, including coffee, my favorite, uh, requires pollination to do full production of the things we grow them for. Okay, let's move on. So, yeah, these are all examples of that 70%, these crops that require animals to either um, pollinate them to produce full fruit or fruit at all. So these are some of the most delicious things I like eating. This is my favorite too for both cacao and almonds are obligate outcrossers. So whenever you have a chocolate covered almond, thank pollinators twice. Um, coffee, of course, pollinated by bees. All the time. So it's about 70% of crops. It's worth easily hundreds of billions of dollars per year. So notably here, a staple crop like rice and corn and wheat and potatoes, the calories that the human race consumes are typically grasses, except for potatoes in that case. They don't require pollination, but the stuff that makes the diet diverse, which makes the diet fun, but it also contains all these micronutrients we need, a lot of them are obligately outcrossed by pollinators. That means they require pollination. Okay. And you don't have to be a scientist to see this. Just go to the grocery store. And you'll see misshapen fruit. And all of these are examples of inadequately pollinated fruit. If you ever see kind of an ill-formed uh, strawberry or droplets or little uh, elements of the raspberry missing or kind of a caved-in cucumber or apple, those are all seeds that didn't get pollinated. Pollinated seeds release this hormone that ripens the flesh around it. And if you don't get that, you get these misshapen fruits. So just go to the grocery store and you can see the consequences of not enough pollination all right, third of three quizzes. Let's get on to who does this for us. How many bee species are there in Vermont? So this is my new home state, so I don't know the numbers for New Hampshire, sorry. So, mull your options. How many people think there are nine species of bees in Vermont? Okay, how many people think it's 54? 129? 275? Okay, it's 275, right? There are 4,000 in the U.S. There's 20,000 globally. Okay, so when people, well, let's I'll talk about this one slide. So when people think about pollinators, they think about this one, honeybees, right? If you ask someone to name a pollinator or name a bee, they'll name this one. Um, and these are, without a doubt, a workhorse of pollination. They do a vast bulk of pollination in this country of these crop plants I've been talking about. But they're not from here. They're European and African. They were brought here because they do such a good job of domesticatedly, if that's a word, pollinating. So it's a domesticated pollinator. We can put them in a box. We can move that box around. We can open up the box and they will swarm all over our crop. Then they'll go in at night, can close the box, take them somewhere else. So they're essentially domesticated livestock. They are the equivalent of sheep or chickens. They are the species of their group that is domesticatable, and so we did. Okay? Um, the problem is, they're sick. 
globally and in this country too. I'm sure you've read about this colony collapse disorder. They're getting barraged by a mix of um, parasites, diseases like viruses, habitat loss, pesticides, that kind of thing. And so our workhorse pollinator is uh, declining. And in most parts of the country, beekeepers lose about 30% of their hives every winter. So they can split them and bring them back, but that's just a costly thing to do. So native bees, again, this, these are the ones that I want to talk about mostly here. The 4,000 other species of bees in this country, many of which can do these pollination as well. Here's a picture of the world's biggest bee and the world's smallest bee together. Um, and like I said, there's 20,000 of them in the world. Many of them are really good crop pollinators. Many of them crop, pollinate crops more efficiently than honeybees do on a sort of per-visit basis. And so one of the things that I'm really interested in asking, and I think it's a really important question for U.S. agriculture, is are we providing what these native bees need in our farmed landscapes for in, for, in order for them to pollinate our crops for us? For us? Right? So I think we can all agree that that's probably not enough native habitat for pollinators to pollinate the crops around it. But is that enough? That's just a landscape near where I live. Right? Is there enough habitat for bees in this landscape to continue this provision of benefit they give us, this subsidy they give us, of free pollination to our crops? Okay. So I just want to tell you three quick stories about trying to answer this question. And by way of telling you those stories, relay some information about what we're learning about the importance of native pollinators. So we're going to talk locally in Vermont, nationally, and then a global assessment. Okay? So let's talk about Vermont first. This is um, Owl's Head Blueberry Farm uh, near Burlington, Vermont. <coughs> One of the places that my lab and I are studying the importance of native bees to the crop and to the farmers. What's the economic <coughs> value of this community of bees to the farmers themselves? So we want to know who pollinates blueberries, how valuable that is as an input to agriculture, like any other input, like labor or water or fertilizer, and uh, how can we manage them better. So the blue bee there is Burlington. All the symbols are the farms that we worked at. Some of them are conventional and some are organic. Now I'm going to show you just some data. So get ready for some, you know, some graphs and stuff. Okay. So we go to these farms and we net bees. Um, uh, we also sort of watch them visit flowers. So you just stand there for 20 minutes, about 100 flowers, and you watch who comes and visits and how often. Um, we do these crazy hand pollination experiments to get at the yield effect. We bring some back into the lab to make sure we can identify them and do some genetic analysis mm -hmm. on them. So this is kind of the work we do. And it's all led by this guy, uh, Charlie Nicholson, who's a PhD student at UVM, and has run the whole Vermont thing I'm about to tell you about. So the most basic thing we find is this who, is who comes to visit blueberries in Vermont. So about 60% of them are bumblebees. 28% are other kinds of native bees. And only 9% of visits, that is bee touching flower, um, were from honeybees. So this dominant national pollinator is almost unimportant in blueberries. Now contrast that to Michigan. This is where this is who pollinates Michigan blueberries. Almost entirely honeybees. <coughs> if you go to the grocery store, especially this time of year, you're getting either Florida or Michigan, Michigan blueberries. Um, so this part of the world has this really nice so far a nationally unique situation and we get most of our economic value of pollination from the native communities, the bees that are out living among us, not the ones we're moving around in boxes. Okay, so there's three groups of major players there. If you like blueberries, these are the bees you should thank for blueberries, especially the local ones. First and most important is bumblebees. There's nine species of those. Another group is mining bees and Drina species. It's a genus. There's about 25 species we found on Vermont blueberry. And the third one are sweat bees, is the nickname. It's a family of today. And there's about 30 of those that we find pollinating uh, blueberries. So each of these rows here is one of the farms. I think we have 15 or 16 farms on this graph. And all I want to show you is each of those colors is kind of a group of pollinators that we can identify just by watching them. We can't get them to species without catching them, and we don't want to bother them, so we have these kind of weird, chunked up groups that we can identify. And what I want you to notice is two things. One, 
there's diversity, right? There's a lot of different colors in each farm. So they're getting pollination benefit from lots of different species. Second thing is they differ a lot. So there's this championship farm here that gets way more than 10 times as many visits. These are visits by bees per standard time as other farms. And if you're a scientist and you see this, this is exciting because there's variation. Some are more than others, and now we can figure out why. If they're all the same, there wouldn't be anything to do after that. But now we can try to explain this, and if we can explain this, we can help all farmers get more bees on their farm. If we can find out what it is about those really diverse farms or really abundant farms, then we can figure out how to give advice to all farmers to, to bring more pollinators back to their land. So one thing we're finding is organic farmers, maybe not super surprising, organic farmers have more visitation, that is more uh, bee love, essentially, more bee activity than conventional farms. And that's got to be because of a combination of they use fewer pesticides, pesticides aren't so great for bees, and also they tend to manage their land in a sort of more diverse, somewhat more messy way, so there's flowers around where it's not so clean. Okay, so that's the first thing we're finding. The other one is we drew a circle around every farm of two kilometers, and then we mapped every piece of land cover around each farm. And we did that for all the farms, and we asked, is, is the neighborhood important? Do you get more bees if you have a better neighborhood around yourself, far beyond the boundaries of your own farm? And this graph is showing that, yes, the more natural area you have near your farm, not necessarily even on it, the more bees you get. So if you're in a good neighborhood that is full of uh, natural habitat, you have sort of a nice, robust, homegrown community of bees. If you're in a really simplified landscape, but not a lot else but crops around, um, you get fewer, right? So there's this nice story here where there's things the farmer can do, but also things the landscape's responsible for in providing a nice pollination service. So that's what the bees do, but you gotta ask whether blueberry cares about that. Does blueberry respond to having more bees, or does it have plenty of bees even in those really low scoring farms, right? So these are where the kind of experiments gets a little weird. So we need to hand pollinate blueberries um, in order to see whether we can make them yield better. If we can, then they weren't yielding well enough in the first place. So it's this pollination limit experiment. It just helps us figure out whether the pollination is adequate at the moment. But blueberries are this funny flower that um, don't have sticky pollen. They have this dry pollen that they keep in this sort of tube. And to get it out, you can't just rake at it as if you're a bee, you have to vibrate your body at a particular frequency, like a tuning fork, and then the flower essentially barfs uh, uh, pollen at you. You just get kind of hit in the chest and then you move it off. And this is why honeybees don't like blueberries, because they don't know how to do that. They didn't evolve with blueberries, they're not from here, and they can't get the reward out of the flower, which is why we don't see them coming. But blue, the bumblebees do. And if you're ever in a blueberry patch when it's flowering, which will be May, so go find you can watch a blue, uh, bumblebee come and grip the flower and just go, Whoo! and this poof happens. So we have to, in order to get pollen, so we can do hand pollen, we have to do that ourselves. So I have like line items on my grant of um, electric toothbrushes, sonic hair toothbrushes. And you can sonicate out the pollen into a petri dish. And so that's like, yeah, it's a weird thing to ask for. <laughs> so here's visitation rate. This is like more bees over here. And this is a measure of the yield of blueberries. Just forget the fancy units. It's just the higher you go, the more your blueberries yielding for you as a farmer. And what we find is, go ahead and, yeah, we find this sort of increase, right? If you get more and more and more and more bees, you yield more and more and more and more as a farmer. And then there's a point at which you get enough, right? And more bees doesn't. It's like diminishing returns. More bees doesn't help as much anymore. So this is a classic relationship of a plant like this that needs pollinators, but there's some farms that arguably have even more than they need. Right? So we're finding that more natural landscapes, more careful management of the farm give you more bees, and more bees gives you more yield. There's an economic reason to keep the native community around. Okay, that was the local one. I'm going to go more quickly through these two now. Now there's a national one as well. So, go ahead. So, um, I told you about Obama. There's this presidential memo, right? And the response was this, this national strategy where every agency said, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to do. And the most relevant part was 
the, um, the federal government agreed to add 7 million acres of bee hab, pollinator habitat over the next five years. That was one of the goals of this strategy. And USDA was going to contribute, Department of Transportation was going to contribute along the sides of highways, um, other agents, uh, BLM and things. So collectively, the goal was 7 million acres. But the big question was, where should we put that? Where's the optimal place to put all that stuff so it does the most good? So we set out to sort of answer this question at the Gund Institute where I work and make a national map of where bees are doing well and where they're not, and where crops demand bees and where they don't. And the intersection of those two things can tell you about where restoration do the most good. So I'll tell you what I mean by that. So I've skipped everything we did and just here's the magic answer. So there's a map of abundance of bees across the U.S. And where it's blue, bees are relatively abundant. Where it's yellow, they're less abundant than they have been. And that's essentially a footprint of agriculture. If you know where food is grown in the U.S., you can see it, right? So intensified ag is not so great for bees. This, by the way, is the work of this guy here, Kim Suko, who, aside from being a great blueberry picker, is a great model. And here's kind of the answer here. We found 139 countries where the abundance on cropland was low and the need for pollinators was high. So we knew where everything's grown and how dependent it is on pollinators. We can come up with an index of how much hunger for pollinators there is in each county and then how many pollinators there are. And this upper left corner there is like the trouble zone, where you have less pollinators than other places and more demand than other places. So there's a mismatch between supply and demand. These are places where we can expect trouble. Inadequate pollination, higher rates for renting honeybees, because there's more demand to replace the natives with honeybees, that kind of thing. And so these are kind of a trouble zone map, and our answer to where might that 7 million acres be best placed. Right? So I can tell you more about that if you'd like to. Uh, we have a really cool interactive thing on the web where you can click around all these counties and get all the stats on them. Um, but just to let you know that there's a sort of national effort to, to focus attention and restoration where we think it might do the most good for at least crop pollination. Okay. These are some of the reasons those hot pink areas are on the map. The crops are all different that demand pollination, but all of them share the problem that intensified land use is making pollinators decline. Okay. Yep, said that. And I'm going to skip this whole thing, so keep going. Okay. Global. Let's get to the biggest picture now. Like I said, this UN body called IPBES, maybe the most awkwardly named UN body ever, IPBES. It's not impossible to say that well. So it's the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And ecosystem services are these things I've been talking about, the economic benefits that nature provides us. Pollination, water purification, carbon storage to slow down climate change, that kind of thing. And this is the UN body that was charged um, to assess the state of the world's ecosystems and what they're doing for us and how dependent we are on them. And like I said, the very first thematic project out the door, our commission was commission us to, to do it on pollinators. Um, go ahead. This is the group that did it. So 124 countries were the first ones to ask for this. And some things came out of that at the global level that kind of put Vermont and New Hampshire in context, I think. One is that um, agriculture is getting even more reliant on pollinators. We're shifting from unpollinated crops towards pollinated ones on average over time. So the value of pollinators is doing nothing but going up over time as the crop mix globally goes up. So this is a map of sort of where um, losses would happen if we took away all bees. Uh, also, there's now a map of economic value, sort of where is the value to economies around the world of uh, inputs from pollinators to crops. So think about that blueberry example, add up all the different crops that need pollinators to all the different degrees all over the world, and you can see where the sort of dependency spots are. Um, interestingly, well, it's where a lot of people are, so where we grow a lot of food, that explains the India-China thing, but also there are hot spots in particularly vulnerable places where developing countries also have this dependence on global pollinators. Okay? The other interesting thing is everyone talks about money, how much money pollinators are worth, but they also are, uh, provide a ton of micronutrients, and this is something that 
my group's getting into recently, because I think it's fascinating and important. Things like vitamin A, folate, different micronutrients that um, uh, are really crucial to our diets come overwhelmingly from pollinated plants. So this is a this is a thing that nature is doing for us. That's not only producing money for us, but it's balancing out our diets. They call this micronutrient deficiency or the hidden hunger. So people get enough calories, but they're not getting these micronutrients, and it leads to um, an unbelievable burden of disease every year uh, globally. So um, these are maps of where crops are grown. This is sort of a dependency of uh, crops, or the vitamin A content of pollinator dependent crops. So there's these hot spots of where vitamin A is coming from and where it's dependent on pollinators. So we're knowing more and more about the health impacts of pollinator loss, not just the economic or natural ones. Some of them then, again, many examples of micronutrient sources that are pollinated. This is the work of Alicia Ellis, a postdoc in my lab who now just moved to Duke. But she did this amazing global analysis that you're seeing. Okay. I'm going to skip that one too. So, kind of take homes from me, some of which I talked more about, some of which these guys will talk about next. But if I <coughs> wished you would take home a few things from this whole night, it would be used that pollinators are really important to natural systems, and we'll hear more about that, and food systems. I'll talk more about that. Both managed and wild species are under threat. So honeybees as well as natural ones. <clears throat> the solutions aren't mysterious or intractable. They are remarkably straightforward and simple things to do. It's not a mystery mm -hmm. what bees need on our landscapes. And I think Vermont and New Hampshire, this kind of region, can actually, this is one of those issues that we can take the lead on. We have this unusually diverse set of crop pollinators, and we have these landscapes that actually can be managed in a way that uh, we can share space uh, where we can thrive as people and farmers and communities, and so can the pollinators around us. Okay, so that's it for me. Thanks for listening. Okay, is this working? Yes. Yes. It is working? Okay, so we're now into our second session. And by the way, um, save up your questions because we have, remember there's question time at the end. So uh, if you've got questions that you're kind of loading up in your brain and you're losing track, you might try to figure out the keyword for each one. So <laughs> keep track of them. So in our second session here, now we have two speakers, and I'll introduce each one as they come up. The first is Kent McFarland, and Kent is the co-founder of the Vermont Center for Eco-Studies. And he did his uh, graduate work also fairly close by down in Keene at Antioch University. And he's um, one of the great communicators amongst uh, conservation biologists. He uh, spends a lot of his time writing very effectively uh, in the media, writing field guides, doing photography, and doing also hosting a radio program. So he's going to communicate effectively with us right now. <laughs> Pressure's on. Question is, is this mic working? Yes. yes. All right. So I have the task of, I'm going to fly today. I'm going to go really fast because we're going to have questions afterwards. Because I have the task of trying to go through and talk about sort of the status and trends of pollinators, in, mostly in Vermont. <coughs> I just got near it and it worked. <laughs> so Sarah, um, Sarah and I, who you're going to hear from in a second, Leif Richardson, who actually was a postdoc with you, um, and he actually graduated for his PhD from, uh, from Dartmouth, we all teamed together and did a bunch of work on bumblebees. And what I'm going to do with this talk is first I'm going to sort of introduce you to pollinators a little bit more, talk about who's a pollinator and who, well I'm not going to talk about who is it because most of, there's a lot of pollinators. And I'm going to sort of go through kind of what we know about the status and the population trends of all the pollinators because you're going to find out real quickly that, you know, it sounds like we know a lot, but it turns out we know about this much about this much. So it's going to be a, a lot of work to do. So first off, Taylor mentioned this first, but here's sort of the, the, 
big groups that are pollinating. We've got bats, bees, beetles, birds, butterflies. Oh, there's a lot of bees there. Um, flies, moths, and wind. That's how good pollination gets done. Wind, we don't care about, it's boring. Um, hey, I know. <laughs> bats, we don't, all the bats here are insectivorous. Um, down further south, the bats get into pollination, so we're not going to worry about that here. I'm not going to talk about beetles too much because honestly, we don't know too much around this area about which beetles are doing what for pollination. There's probably a lot of them, but we are hard pressed to even say a lot about them right now. But I will touch real quickly on um, birds, butterflies, flies, moss, and then really get into bees. So here's one of the things I want to point out. This is in Vermont, the Biodiversity of Vermont. And we know exactly how many vertebrates we have in Vermont. There's 426 vertebrates in Vermont. We know exactly, pretty much, how many vascular plants we have. When it gets down to invertebrates, which is what most of the pollinators are, even here in Vermont, we only have a wild guess at how many invertebrates exist in Vermont. And it's somewhere between 15, 20,000. The other day we tried to guess and it was 34,000 we came up with. So we don't, actually don't even know what invertebrates we have. And that's a problem when it comes to pollinators. Um, skip this one. So I'm going to first talk about what we do know, and that's with the vertebrates. We know a lot about birds. How many people here are bird watchers? How many people here are bee watchers? How many people here are bee watchers but not honey bee watchers? Okay, and all of a sudden dropped way down, right? There's a lot of bird watchers, and that's great. We know a lot about birds. We have one that's a really good pollinator, and that's ruby-throated hummingbird. And I love this story about this bird. Um, how many people know what this flower is? Who knows this? Jewelweed, Jewel exactly grows in our little wet spots in the backyard. And what's really amazing about this is some work done at UMass is, if you notice on jewelweed, it's, the flower hangs down on this little stem that comes down, and the flower bobs really easily. And the nectar is way at the end of this horn right here, sort of what, how Taylor was talking about with Darwin's discovery, but not quite as long, obviously. And what happens is, is this hummingbird comes up to the jewelweed, and it has to stick its tongue in the front the whole way down and around to the end of that little horn to get at the nectar. And when it's doing that, it's pulsing its tongue in there. And that stem of that flower is tuned to the pulse of the hummingbird's tongue so that the flower bounces back and forth just the right amount on that tension to smack the forehead of the hummingbird over and over and put pollen all over his forehead. Amazing pollination story. So there's a lot of flowers like that that, are, that this hummingbird is going to all summer long. And the good news is that this hummingbird is doing really well right here. The top is the Breeding Bird Survey, which is run by citizen scientists. Every June, volunteers go out across the nation and do these specific <coughs> routes where they count birds, and that's how we have good data on bird populations. And here in Vermont, they're doing really well. It's about a 2% annual increase in hummingbirds, so they're doing really well. We do the Breeding Bird Atlas every 25 years. Again, all citizen scientists. How many people here worked on the Breeding Bird Atlas? A handful of people worked on the Breeding Bird Atlas in here, so that's great. All citizen science, we have really good data on what's going on with hummingbirds, and it echoes. They're doing really well. To keep them doing really well, there's one thing you can do. You can, and what is that? Don't look like Joey. Like, how many people watch Friends? Joey, look. Drink coffee. Shade grown coffee. Ruby throated hummingbirds overwinter in Central America and they love shade grown coffee. They do really well in shade grown coffee plantations. So, shade grown coffee is one way every morning you can help hummingbirds. Easy. Is Doug Hardy in here? No. So, he, he sells birds and beans coffee for people. So, buy shade grown coffee. Next. So, we got some birds that do some pollination, but you know what? There's some real workhorses besides bees, and those are flies. Flies are super workhorses that we kind of ignore. Everyone doesn't think about flies as being pollinators. They think they're picky. But flies, if you look at them, all these species of flies were taken in Vermont. There's flower flies are really, they look like bees. A lot of them, during our survey, we'd often get bees sent in to us by volunteers who thought they were bumblebees and they're flies. And how can you quickly tell if it's a, a bee or a fly? Anybody know? Sarah? <laughs> Antenna? And flies have two wings and bees have four. So it's pretty easy to tell if you've looked very closely. These are workhorses, these flies. We don't know much about them in Vermont. There's 71 families of flies that, that pollinate. There's over 100 crop plants that are pollinated by flies. The only thing we know pretty much in the world is hoverflies, these flower flies, 
have been losing diversity in the UK and in the Netherlands where they actually study them. We don't have a clue. I, I think we'd be hard pressed to give a final list of, how, of what the species are in Vermont, let alone what, how they're doing here. So even though they're workhorses, we know nothing about their trends here at all that I know of. Um, are they as good as bees? Probably not. They, they can carry, on average, about half the pollen load as bees, but still, they are visiting a lot of flowers. Uh, the next is my favorite, <coughs> butterflies and moths. Uh, we know a little bit more about, about butterflies. We're pretty much clueless about moths in, in Vermont when it comes to, uh, unless they're pest species. There's probably about, I think I'm working on right now, but there's about 2,500 species of moths known for Vermont. There's a lot. Um, yeah, exactly. There's about 110 butterfly species. Um, there's a lot of studies been happening in California, U.S. prairies, U.K., where there's been declines. We don't have good data here in the Northeast for what's going on with a lot of these things. Um, but I can tell you a couple stories about butterflies because we do have a little bit of data. Go ahead. We did the Vermont Butterfly Atlas. And again, I'm going to tell you again, this is another citizen science project where we couldn't have done it without a ton of volunteers. We covered the whole state. Took us six years, um, over 140 volunteers. We had 36,000 records, and you can see here's the state. Here's where we went in the state. We literally covered the state in five years, finding out where all the butterflies lived, and allowed us to give a status assessment for them, and it allowed us to find out that hey, there's a bunch of that are in trouble. If you just click it, it'll it'll do this. So the the top part, you can just go back one. So we had a whole group that are woodland species that are kind of in, in, uh, in trouble, they're kind of rare. I'm gonna go through some of those in a second. We had a group that were bog species, I think is next. Two that lives in, live in bogs only. Um, if you click again, we have a whole group that lives in sedge meadows, sedge wetlands, and then a few that are in, um, in grasslands in Vermont. All these, because of all that work we found out, are they're kind of conservation concern species. But since then, there's been no monitoring of them. There's there's nothing going on with them, so we don't really know how they're doing. But I'm going to tell you a story, since Vermont is 80% forest, I'm going to tell you a story about two pollinators, two butterfly pollinators, that only live in forests, which you think as butterflies as being out in the open, these will only be in the forest. And the first one is the West Virginia white. This butterfly will never leave the forest. If you isolate a patch of forest with West Virginia whites and surround it with field, it's stuck in that little patch. It can't disperse. It will never leave the forest. It's it's afraid to leave the forest. Um, it's fully reliant on this one plant, toothwort, which is this beautiful um, spring ephemeral wildflower that comes up. And the, this wildflower has to bloom, grow and bloom and seed really quickly before the overstory closes on it and creates shade. And the butterfly follows suit because its caterpillar feeds on that plant. So this flight period for this adult caterpillar is only about a two or three week period. It's really fast before the canopy closes shut. And the thing about it is, as a pollinator is, is this, even though it feeds on this, it also pollinates it. So there's, it's sort of like, I guess, you know, you can think of the plant as giving up a few of its leaves to the caterpillar and in turn it gets pollinated so it can set seed. So they're kind of in cahoots in the forest. Both of them are wholly reliant on being deep in the deciduous forest. Problem is, is that we've got a lot of deforestation south of here. We actually have a really good population in, in southern Vermont now compared to places like Connecticut. Um, the other problem is if you get poor spring weather and it causes problems with um, senescence with the plants really quickly. And the other thing is, is garlic mustard, introduced species. I'm sure some of you in this crowd have pulled out this stuff. Uh, it's an introduced species that has a chemistry that sort of mimics the host plant, the native host plant, so that when the butterfly lands on it and butterflies taste with their feet, it pricks the, the plant and tastes with its foot. It tastes it and it seems like it's toothwort and it lays an egg on it. The problem is, is when the caterpillar hatches out and starts to feed on it, it kills it. It has a chemistry that actually kills the larva. So it's a dead end for the butterfly. The second one I, that is wholly reliant on the woods are early hair streaks. And this is an amazing butterfly. If you ever have the pleasure of seeing this, it's this amazing blue when it opens up. And it, it's wholly reliant on beech trees. And what it feeds on is it feeds on the seeds of the beech tree, which is pretty amazing. The caterpillar goes through the husk of the beech tree and starts and feeds on the seed. And that and won't feed on the leaf, won't feed on anything else, but only the seed. So how go the beech trees and the beech seed go this butterfly? 
and the butterfly is often way up in the canopy. The problem though is, is with beech trees, is that beech bark disease, how many know what beech bark disease is? Yeah, it's prevalent everywhere. It was introduced, um, it's, I'm not going to go into the big details, but there was an insect, a scale insect that was introduced, and a fungus that the scale insect has and injects it into the tree, and the tree starts to rot and look sort of cankerous like this and eventually kills it. And then the tree falls and dies, but it'll often, it'll often re-sprout from its roots, but it never gets to be old enough. It takes a couple of decades to three or four decades for a beech tree to start to really flower and fruit, so it never gets to be the age to fruit again. And for this butterfly, it needs the fruit, so it never can reproduce. So eventually, it's going to be bad news for this butterfly. Again, another introduced species. So we do know a little bit about butterflies. We know a lot, of, a lot more about some other ones. But let's get into the real workhorses of, uh, of pollination, which are the bees. And as Taylor said, there's about 270 species known in Vermont. And I like to say known because we haven't really done a complete bee inventory of Vermont. I'm sure there's a bunch of more species. I'm sure your students find them all the time when they're out doing work. So it's probably incomplete. Um, but there's, a, there's been a lot of discussion about range retractions in the EU and the UK and in North America. There's been diversity declines in Europe, North America, and South America. Um, but the problem is we always just kind of lump bees together in this big group. And there's so many species and so many we don't know about. Here in the Northeast, there's been one study that's looked at a lot of the bee species in the Northeast. And it's an amazing study. And it went in to all the collections in the Northeast and databased all the bees in collections going back 140 years and used that to start to understand over time how bee populations using relative abundance may have changed over the last 140 years. And besides bumblebees, that's really one of the only good sources we have for the Northeast right now for, for trajectories. And what we find is, is that a lot of the bees are doing okay and some of them are doing really poorly. And if you, Look at this closely, you'll see that it keeps saying Bombus is doing bad. And up here in this chart, where we have, here's the northernmost latitude that each species, each circle is recorded, and here's the rate of change. What you'll notice on this chart is, is that, first off, blue are bumblebees, so a lot of the bumblebees are declining. And most of the bee species, the further you go north, the more of them that are declining. And the thought is, is that there's probably some land use change and climate change and cahoots going on there, um, change in causing some of these declines. But there's a bunch of bee species that are declining, but again, over and over again, including this study, it's always bumblebees that come up as this decline is happening that is obvious. So if we look at that closer, the next great study was in Ontario, where they actually did bumblebee studies in the early 70s, and this student uh, went back out and actually went to the exact same spots in, in the year 2004 to 2006 and redid the surveys of these bumblebees and found out that about half of the bumblebees had seriously declined in Ontario over that time period and four of the species had actually been extirpated, had gone extinct there. So that was the first real outcry for in the east around here where, wow, bumblebees are in big trouble according to this study, which then really got us interested in doing the bumblebee survey that we did. Well, we took two years where, and used citizen scientists and Sarah went all over, heck, all over the place doing surveys and we wanted to find out what was going on with the bumblebees closer to home here. But before I get to that, I, I want Sarah to sort of talk a little bit about bumblebees, sort of about their natural history because I want you to see how cool they are before I give you the bad news about them. Right? <laughs> there is some good news. Good. So our next speaker is Sarah Zahendra, and Sarah is, um, she's from Texas and did her training in Texas and worked for Bat Conservation International there for quite a while, educating folks in Texas about bats, which probably was a hard sell. <laughs> Sarah has very strong international connections, uh, particularly Mexico and Israel. She's been a zookeeper, uh, teacher, and interpreter. She's done a lot of different things. All right, so um, when we were sort of deciding what all of us were going to talk about tonight, um, we all collaborated and, and thought, I'm going to talk about this, and Ken's going to talk about that, and Taylor's got this, and then I went off on my own and unilaterally decided that the only thing I wanted to talk about was bumblebees. <laughs> and the reason for that is that is the path by which I really became interested in pollinators and pollinator decline. 
And so what I want to do is I want to spend a little bit of time sort of personalizing pollinators for everybody. And so that you can maybe make the sort of connection that, that some of the rest of us have made about why these are so important, not just because of their economic importance and for what, how they help humans, but because of their intrinsic value, because they're fascinating creatures as well. So, if you, if I want somebody to love something like I do, they first have to understand about it. They have to know it. Can you Go use ahead, the mic, please? Do what? Oh, use the mic. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Sarah's heard that on. Do what? Can you hear me now? How about now? There we go. Now you got me, right? Yes. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is meet the cast. And in this way, they are a little bit like um, honeybees that everybody knows a lot about. If you look at these columns, the first one is the type of adult bee. What do they do? How many are in a bumblebee colony? And what do they look like? So, of course, we're going to start with the queen. What does the queen do? She lays eggs and she founds a colony. How many are there in a bumblebee colony? With a caveat that I'm going to talk about in just a second, there is one, only one queen. And what do they look like? They're big, they're fuzzy, they have a very loud buzz. You will see them in a couple of months now. They're going to be the first bumblebees that you see start to come out of hibernation. And they stink. Um, the second type of adult bee is a worker bee, and they do exactly what their name implies. They do all of the work for the colony. So everything from taking care of the larva to building the structures within the colony. They <coughs> clean, they forage, they defend. How many of them are there in a bumblebee colony? So this depends on the species, it depends on the time of year, it depends on the resources in the area. But there can any, be anywhere from less than 50 to over 400. And what do they look like? Oftentimes they will look like a smaller version of the bumblebee queen. They are also able to sing. And last, and um, actually least, is the male. <laughs> um, what do they do in a bumblebee colony? They mate, and then they die. How many are there in a bumblebee colony? Between zero and 50, and again, that depends on the species, the time of year, the resources. And what do they look like? This is actually kind of interesting. They're sort of intermediate in size between the queen and the worker bee. Um, not all of them, but some of the species have much larger eyes than the females do. They tend to be hairier. Um, and they also have a much, well, a little bit longer of an abdomen. They've got one extra segment on their abdomen. And the great thing about these guys is that they do not sting. So um, this is actually a pretty neat party trick for friends and family. If you go out in your garden and you can tell the difference between male and female bees, you can grab a male bee and hold it for everybody to look at. Um, but I've actually seen Ted McFarland get that wrong. <laughs> so just learning your bees really well before you try and do that. All right, next slide. Okay, so now I want to get into the life cycle of a bumblebee because this is actually very different from what we know about honeybees, right? Honeybees have a perennial colony cycle. Year after year, you can keep the hive going um, if, if, you're, if you take good enough care of them. But that's not the case with bumblebees. Bumblebees have an annual cycle. And so we're going to start with where the bumblebees are in their annual cycle right now. And if you look down at the very bottom of the slide, that is a depiction of a queen bumblebee underground because she is in hibernation right now. Where do they hibernate? It depends. Sometimes they're going to hibernate in an abandoned rodent hole. Sometimes they will um, excavate very shallow holes under the ground. Oftentimes you can find them in leaf litter, um, in compost, rock walls, wood piles. So in about a month, roughly, those queen bees are going to start coming out of hibernation, right? So the snow starts to melt, it gets warmer, the sun is out for longer. They're going to start coming out of hibernation. And the first thing they need is energy. So those early spring floral resources are critically important for bumblebees because without those, she's not going to be able to get the energy that she needs, the resources that she needs to start a colony. So things like rhododendrons, willows, even the dread dandelion that my husband tries to yank up out of our yard every single year, these are all important floral resources for bumblebees. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so the next thing that she's going to do is she's going to find a suitable stop, uh, spot to start her colony. 
Where is that? That can also be in an abandoned rodent hole. Now this kind of depends on the species. So it could be an abandoned rodent hole. Sometimes um, people will find them in, um, in their homes, in their birdhouses. There are some species that nest on top of the ground as well. So if you look at the very top, that picture up there, is a Bombus griseocollis nest. These bees will nest on top of the ground, underneath thatches of grass. So when you're thinking about mowing, right, you think about the fact that some of these bees are actually, their entire colonies are really on top of ground, which is why we talk about maybe leave part of your land unmowed, or don't mow for the entire summer, don't you know, wait until September or October until these colonies are coming to their end before you mow. So the next thing that she's going to do after she's found a suitable spot to, to start her colony is she, this is actually really fascinating, she is going to start to exude wax from in between the underside of her abdominal segments, which are called turga. And she's going to scrape that wax off, and she starts to build structures for, the, for, for her colony. Two of the structures that she makes, you can also see up there in that picture. One of them is a honey pot, and she's going to store regurgitated nectar, small amounts of it, in that honey pot. And then the next structure she makes are going to be a set of cells. And that's where she's going to lay her first brood of eggs. That first set of cells tends to be really small, only between six, eight, maybe ten little cells. So, and, and if you look up there, right, you can see it's, it's really not very much to it. And Kent, Leaf, and I actually uncovered that um, while we were doing a bee survey. And we photographed it, we stuck our pinkies in the honey pot and actually tasted um, the sugar water. And then we were able to cover it back up, the queen returned, and went back about her business. So that is the beginning of a bumblebee. So after she builds these structures, what she's going to do is she's going to lay her first brood of eggs in those cells. And those are fertilized eggs that are going to hatch out into non-reproductive female workers. She lays those eggs. She provisions the cells with pollen loaves. Now, if you've ever watched your uh, bumblebees in your garden, you can kind of see as they're flying around that they're these huge, bright, lumps of orange and yellow on their honey tibia. These are what we call pollen loaves. And what they'll do, if you watch them as they're, as they're foraging off your flowers, they're going to mix nectar and saliva and pollen together. And then they put these pollen loaves in something that we call corbicula. And it's a concave portion of their honey tibia that is surrounded by branch hairs. And that way they can take large amounts of pollen back and provision their nest, their young, with these pollen loaves. So she lays her eggs, she provisions them with pollen, and then she crawls on top of them and she's going to vibrate her, her wing muscles in order to create heat to incubate those eggs. Four or five days later, the eggs are going to hatch out, and then the larvae are going to, to eat the pollen that she has provisioned for them. It takes about two weeks for them to go through two, four larval instars, at which point they're going to pupate, and then take another two weeks, roughly, for the pupa to develop. So start to finish, egg to adult bumblebee, four to six weeks, depending, of course, on the species, on the weather, and uh, on their ability to, to, to find resources in the area. All right, so those first sets of bees, those first broods of bees that hatch out are all going to be worker bees. And as we know, they're the ones that do all of the work for the colony. So she continues to lay eggs, those workers continue to build structures for the colony. They go out, they forage, they start to care for the larvae, they defend. And after a while, the queen bee stops leaving the nest altogether. And she simply lays eggs for the rest of her life. Sometime late in the summer, again depending on the species, late in the summer, the queen bee is going to start laying different eggs. <coughs> These eggs are unfertilized, and they're going to hatch out into reproductive males, or drones. Right around this time, she also begins to lay eggs that are destined to become the next year's females. Now we're looking at late summer, early fall. The colony's starting to come to an end. The drones will immediately leave the colony. They'll mate with a queen, hopefully from another colony, and they die. The workers are starting to die off. The old queen, the founder of that colony, will also die. And then the only thing left are the newly hatched queens who have recently mated. As it starts to get cold again, they start to look for a nice 
place to overwinter, a warm place like a compost patch or a rodent hole, and they crawl down in there, and they go into hibernation, and we're back where we started from. And so I was going to talk about one other thing, but you know what, I think I'm going to skip it and give this back to Kent so he can go through what he's going to add. The rest of the stuff he needs to go through. Okay, real quickly, we got just a few minutes, but so now that Sarah talked about the bumblebees and how cool they are, now you're going to feel bad to say because a lot of them aren't doing so hot. So what we did was, in a two-year survey using a lot of volunteers, is we covered all over Vermont, but we also, just like the first study I talked about, we went and did all the historic collections we could find. So we went up to UVM and we spent days in the UVM collections going through all the old bumblebees going back 50, 60, 70 years, IDing them all, databasing them all, so we had an understanding of what happened in the past. And actually we went through collections at Yale that originally came from Dartmouth that helped found the Montshire. Those collections are really important, and it's just another display of how important some of these old historic collections are, because we would have no data to compare it to without them. So we did that, went and databased all kinds of bumblebee collections for Vermont stuff. Then we went out and did our own modern collections so we could compare the two. And so we had this old data set from historic stuff, and then we had the stuff that we collected, and then we also made sure we just used it stuff from where the old historic collections were too, so we dumbed down our collection a little bit because we got carried away and did so much collecting. The first thing we found, which was known of it a lot, is the Rusty Patch Bumblebee had disappeared from Vermont. It used to be dirt common in Vermont collections. The students at UVM would collect it regularly without problem, and the last one was found in 1999. We went all over the state, and it's it's pretty much gone. It's only exists in probably five places in North America right now, and it's listed as endangered in Vermont, and it's probably going to be federally listed, maybe um, in the next few months or so. So it's gone. That it used to be very common. You can see it was all over the map, and it's gone. Um, and if you look at the whole fauna collection, if you just these are all the different species that were once found in Vermont or that found now, and this is the change in relative abundance of them in the historic collections versus the collections we did. And so any bars on this side was an increase, and any bars on this side was a decline. And you can see that about half of them actually increased, and half of them declined. But those that declined, three of them are actually, yeah, three of them are now extirpated. They're completely gone from the state. Um, and one of them, though, an interesting one, Tericola here at the top, which underwent a really strong decline after 1999, actually looks like it might be rebounding. It really was barely found until recently, until 2009, all of a sudden it started showing up again. And once again, this was one of those bumblebees that was dirt common before, until in the late 1990s it just disappeared. And during the atlas, we actually discovered it in quite a few places, so it looks like Here's a bee that underwent severe decline in the 1990s and earlier. It actually be rebounding a little bit. So I'd like to see this as a little glimmer of hope if we start doing things to help them. Uh, let's skip this. Skip that. Skip that. And go to this. Uh, yeah. No, it's fine. You can go back. So after all that, what we find is, you know, we talk about pollination, pollinator decline, but really not everything is declining. Some of the stuff is still doing pretty well. And so we want to know what is going on with the stuff that's been declining. And if you look at it overall, it looks like the bumblebees that are really declining are those that have sort of narrow ecological niches. They have, nest, they have nesting sites they might need that are uncommon. Um, they don't like human habitation, for example. Um, there's been a lot of agriculture intensification that affects some of these bumblebees. Um, a big one is there's been a newer sort of systemic class of insecticides called neonics, neonicotoids, that actually are really devastating to bees. And some of these bees are very, very sensitive to that. Um, and then climate change, of course, always comes up, and there's some pretty good evidence for some of them. But the big one for, some of the, for the, a lot of these bumblebees is pathogen spillover. And I'm not going to get into it now, but I can talk about it if you ask me some questions about it, but there is a whole bunch of pathogens introduced to the United States, and one of them is Crothidia, this little gut parasite, really affects these four species of bumblebees that 
heavily declined in the 1990s. It looks like it was brought in accidentally <coughs> with bumblebees that are used to help um, pollinate tomato plants mostly. And so, as Taylor was saying, we use honeybees, but now we actually are also using bumblebees in agriculture, mostly for glass houses to grow tomatoes indoors. They use bumblebees because, as Taylor was saying, that sonification, they vibrate their wings real hard. Well, you have to have that to uh, properly pollinate tomatoes. You, they have to vibrate to release the, the pollen. And so, besides going around the tuning fork and doing that, literally, in the greenhouse, they discovered if they used bumblebees, and they can buy them and bring them in in boxes, but then they can pollinate their greenhouses. Well, the problem is when they brought them in, they likely had some of these parasites that may have been released into the wild and really quickly decimated some of these populations of bumblebees. So it might be an explanation for some of the real rapid declines in the 1990s for some of these bumblebees we see in Vermont. But the real story here, we think, though, is, is that it's, a, it's a, sort of a witch's brew. It's, it's a little bit of everything that's affecting these bumblebees. Um, and some of the things are... Uh, that we can do about them are easy. I mean, things about introduced species, things about diversifying our crops, diversifying our landscape, things like that, not using these really uh, disastrous systemic uh, chemicals. There's things that we know <coughs> and we can get them to recover. And so with that one bumblebee that's coming back lately, I kind of have this feeling like, you know, if we just do a little bit better job, we can get some of these others to come back. And maybe even start to bring back some that are extirpated in Vermont that are found elsewhere. Maybe we could start growing them and reintroducing them if we can start doing this. So, you know, I want to look at this as, as a hope that we can do a lot better with bumblebees and other pollinators too. And so with that, I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and we can answer questions and talk more about it. Maybe we can thank our speakers. Oh. Okay, now for all these questions you've been saving up. I want to ask about um, how important it is for there to be different different flowers flowering at different seasons to keep a bunch of bees going. In other words, if they're in a place where there's only one crop, um, then what do they do the rest of the time? Anybody hear that? So I'm just going to repeat the question to make sure I heard it because we're sort of getting organized up here, but also, so, well, so how important is it to have a diversity of flowers to support bees? So I'll start with that one. I think my answer is it's pretty important, um, especially in landscapes that have been kind of simplified by agriculture. So if you imagine a big field of, let's just say blueberries again, that's a bonanza of resource for bees. But it's a bonanza for exactly three weeks. And there's a lot of weeks in the summer, especially if you're doing that whole life cycle um, that Sarah talked about. So um, a diversity of plants often can mean a diversity of flowering times, which means there's kind of a buffet on for those bees through the whole summer. What you'll want to avoid is a big, huge buffet and then a desert for a month and a half. So a lot of agricultural landscapes are like that. And a lot of the practical advice we give farmers is just um, grow plants in and around your farm that flower at different times than does your crop to try to get that even resource going. How secure is your grant money considering the new administration? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. That's the two questions. <laughs> uh, so, can you guys hear me okay if we don't get the mic back? Yeah, thank you. Is this, yeah. Okay. Question was how secure is our grant money uh, given the new administration, right? Fair? So uh, the uh, simple question to answer is we don't know. Um, we don't know. I've just submitted two USDA and one EPA grants, and maybe that was a total fool's errand in the last month. But they are planning to give away their budgeted research money. Um, I think. Uh, so we don't know. It's just completely uncertain. And we're sort of assuming, either naively or because there's nothing else to do, that it'll continue to be at least funded at some degree. So that's a stay tuned thing. Okay. Okay. Um, the butterfly survey and the bee survey were both funded on what are called state wildlife grants. And those actually come from the federal government. And it actually, in Vermont, for example, 
those grants from the federal government to each state, and Vermont it pays for all non-game work. So all the non-game work that happens in Vermont is paid on federal money, basically. And the out and those have actually decreased over the last, during the Obama administration, actually decreased. And they're probably they're, there's worry they might actually go away um, completely. So it would devastate the non-game programs, and then the money that we get to actually do the, all these surveys that produced. Um, the day of the show, so we're a little worried. <laughs> so, yes. um, the question I had was about monocultures because the large farms, agricultural concerns, the industrial farms, like out west in California, where there's hundreds of thousands of acres of one plant, and when you have the mall cultures, like you said, it's a feast for a certain period of time and then it's famine for a certain period of time. How much uh, cooperation do you get from farmers? Uh, or is there this, this cooperation that goes on about how to respond to bee population decline with respect to monocultures? And then also, how much uh, resistance or pushback are you getting from the manufacturers of those neonicotinoids that um, uh, that are produced as a pesticide, and and is there anything that we can do in fighting that uh, that pushback? Okay. I'm having trouble. I'm having trouble here. Yes. No. no. Okay. Dang it. Okay, you're gonna get exercise. Okay, that was a great question. Um, and it was two parts. One is about um, intensified agriculture, so big monocultures. Are farmers interested and active in trying to um, manage bees on them? And then the second one was about the neonicotinoid and the pesticide industry, and are they pushing back against efforts to control those pesticides because of their impact on bees and other um, insects that they're not meant to poison, right? These are um, kind of side effects. So I'll answer the first one and maybe pass it for the second one. So the first one, I think um, I, the farmers I work with and the farmers I know all are interested in this question, especially if their crops require pollination. Um, and there are several uh, great examples of farmers taking sort of marginally productive land, stuff that wasn't yielding very well anyway. So the opportunity cost of not cropping there anymore, you're not losing much by stopping and growing pollinator strips. And we're getting really good at um, recommending what the flower mix is to get this constant buffet all summer um, and what the economic return is likely to be. So we can get some nice uh, advice for them on how to plant it, what to expect in terms of yield increase, and whether that pencils out in terms of cost benefit relative to what it costs, right? So there's good examples um, from almond and blueberry and apple and mixed veggie growers. Um, again, the big monocultures like soybeans and corn don't need pollinators. So it's a little bit moot there. The last thing I'll say is there's a government program called the CRP, the Conservation Reserve Program, which pays farmers to take stuff out of production if it's highly erodible. So it's like a water quality project at the beginning. So instead of growing corn somewhere, you, you keep it in grass to keep it from eroding into the creek. There's now a, a version of that where you can plant, instead of grass, you can plant pollinator mix, and you get uh, more money from the government to do it, and you get higher in the queue to enter the program. So there's this nice tweak to an existing program that was meant for something else that could get us maybe half of that 7 million acres right there. So there's a couple of them. And farmers are signing up. They're oversubscribing to that program. Here it is. I'm talking too much. No, it's fine. Okay. Uh, so the very first thing I'd say about neonicotinoids is that the stuff you use in your garden can have many times more power to it than they're actually using for big agriculture. And you wouldn't know it. Um, because there's so many different names, chemical names, for the group of neonicotinoids that you wouldn't need, you'd, you'd have to know what you're looking at in the label to know that you're buying something for a garden and it would have this this insecticide in it. And the problem with it is it's it's systemic and it's a neurotoxin. So 
The more work that keeps coming out with bees, the more we find that it doesn't take very much of it to maybe not even kill the bee, but actually let them carry stuff back to their back to their colonies and then not have the young grow as well, for example. So there's sort of this insidious thing that can happen too with very small doses. But going back to the, your home garden sprays, there if you go if you're familiar with the Zirsi Society, if you go online and find them, they have a beautiful pamphlet that actually tells you we have it. they have the pamphlet awesome yes, it's, it's pick up that beautiful pamphlet back there Everybody. yeah Everybody. it tells you the chemical name and, and what it's in so you can actually when you go you can look and say well i don't want to buy this you know product because it's got this neonic in it um, you really don't want to use that in your garden at all if at all possible it's, the other problem with neonics is is that when you go to your in the springtime if you go and buy a pot and plant for example the potted plant may actually have, unless it's labeled well, it may actually have had neonics in it wherever it came from, the nursery it came from, and that can actually be systemic into the, into the bush or the flower that you already bought, and it'll be in there for a while and it'll be in the pollen. And so you might inadvertently buy plants that have neonics in them and not even know it and put them in your garden. So, you know, having good label, you know, going somewhere that has good labeling and understanding of what's in their plants that you're buying is really important. Um, and then I'll just say, the, what's that? Yeah, exactly. So, and one other thing is, uh, as well is, sorry, okay. The, the, it's not only the plants that oftentimes will be treated with these, it's not only the plants yeah, that'll be uh, treated with these neonicotinoids, but it's also the seeds oftentimes. So if you buy inorganic seeds from certain big box um, stores, oftentimes these seeds will be coated with the neonicotinoids, and it doesn't even say it on the package. So. Yeah, just keep in mind that in the EU, it's banned right now. So it's really something that needs to be looked at a lot, a lot closer. I'm not saying it has to be banned here, but it just it needs a lot more regulation. And what about the corporate pushback uh, of the, the producers of these chemicals? Out of our wheelhouse. They leave us alone. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. A quick, quick uh, testing on. Are you hearing we me now, sir? Yeah, thank you. Uh, quick follow-up to that. You mentioned garlic mustard. Mustard. Barbara McElroy is our Xena Princess Warrior of garlic <laughs> mustard in the back, back row there, and she's recruited me. Uh, my, uh, you know, Roundup is one way to get rid of it, uh, and Roundup's pretty good in the springtime, I understand, when it's about the only thing out there, uh, and it's, it's very difficult to pull it. I'm interested in your position regarding how to get rid of garlic mustard relative to uh, being kind to pollinators. Thanks. You can eat it. <laughs> well, that's not very good. Um, I actually don't really, uh, Barbara probably knows more actually than I do. Um, it's, using Roundup is not probably that big of a deal for most of the pollinators. Um, it's, unless you're killing the plant that they're using. You're using um, it in April because that's the, it's the only thing that's yeah, so, yeah, um, as you know, pooling only works so much when you have so much of it. Um, the, the butterfly that I talked about is mostly in southern Vermont. Not I haven't found it around here yet, um, even though the, its host plant is here. And it's mostly deep in the forest where mostly garlic mustard hasn't invaded down there yet, deep into the forest. But if you get any forestry operations nearby or something, it does tend to get dragged down the skidder roads and in there. But yeah. I don't, I don't have much to say other than Barbara probably knows way more than I do. Well, you guys know? Same boat. Thank you. Okay, more questions? I have one. Um, I was wondering, are all, are all flowers um, and their pollen nectar equally nutritious for pollinators? No. Are all flowers and their pollen and nectar equally nutritious for pollinators? And the answer is no. And not all pollinators are equally efficient at doing their end of the bargain, which is moving the pollen from where it should be to where it should be, right? So we know a little bit about that second thing I just said, and a little bit more about relative efficiency of pollinators per visit. But we also are getting really much better at the chemistry of nectar and pollen. And there's sort of micronutrient deficiency problems in bees as well. Lee Fritchardson, this guy we keep mentioning, who's been most recently working with me, but for a long time with them, has shown that um, bumblebees actually can self-medicate by recognizing they have a parasite in their gut, uh -huh. 
and selectively drinking the nectar that's higher in a compound that flushes that parasite out. Right? So we can show that in experiments in greenhouses and show it in nature too. So that's just one of the many, many ways that nectar differs among plants in ways that matter to bees. And now we know there's a belief in ways that bees know matters to them. Or at least instinctively are drawn to the odors or something. Nope. Or repeat it. <coughs> what is your um, take on cultivars and hybridized flowers versus true species, and how the backyard gardener would um, basically need to know if you're going to plant a flower, do you want to plant a flower that actually helps? Um, a pollinator versus one that does nothing for it, or is it uh, uh, sterile? Yeah, so I'll start that, but I think you should tell your group and garden oh, yeah. So uh, the question just repeated was, uh, when you're a gardener and you're choosing plants, uh, there's sort of wild-type plants, especially the local ones, and then there's the hybridized ones, maybe for show or for resistance to something. You have those options at a greenhouse, and do we have insight on them? What you should do. Is that a fair repeat? How, well, basically, how does the average gardener know yeah. that if they're going to plant something that's pretty, yep. wouldn't you want to plant something that also helps yeah. native Right, so, um, one that doesn't. that's right. So, if you have a choice of plants, all of which are pretty, you know, wouldn't you want to choose the native one? And I would agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, uh, and there is increasingly, the good news is there increasingly, as you probably know, nurseries that specialize in native stock. Not just native species, but native races and populations of those. And the more kind of wild type you can get, uh, the more likely the pollinators are to like it. So I'm just going to, you can just watch in your own garden some of these sort of national ornamentals. Just things don't come to them as much sometimes. Often they're really popular, but not all the time. And you have like a lupin story yeah. like that. No, we were actually just talking about this beforehand, that um, I have a pollinator garden at my house, and I love to just sit there and watch, and I actually put a large sort of showy lupin in there, and right in the middle of it, and it was it's a cultivar, it's not, it's not wild. And it's beautiful and huge, and it's right in the middle of my pollinator garden, and I watch the bees all the time going all around, and they'll come near it, and then they just fade away. And there's these little andrena bees that come by, and they'll land on it for a second, and it's, I don't know what they're sensing, but they don't even bother, they just take off. It looks like it would be an awesome pollinator plant, but it's some cultivar, it's probably useless. It probably has no nectar or anything in it, and it looks great to us, but they know, they just sense it and leave right away. So you can see it happening sometimes right in your garden. Uh, for Taylor, um, it's on. Just go close. My question is, uh, with your blueberry farms, uh, that data set was really interesting. Uh, you know, that one that had incredible diversity, and the rest were just you know, marginal or nothing. Yeah. Now tell me, can the soil on those farms be a control on the quality of the nectar that would say that you know that particular farm that had about Two pollinators hanging out. And forget it. Don't grow blueberries. Yep. <laughs> because you can't produce blueberries with the appropriate flavored nectar. Yep. So the question was um, back to the data I showed about how some farms were superstar farms full of lots of bee visits, and some were really uh, not so good, and some were really quite bad. And he was asking, Gary was asking whether the soil might have something to do with it. Maybe the soil was great at that farm that had such great visitation. Because if the soil is so great, the plant is healthy and um, pumping out really nutritious nectar and things. So, okay, that was a long repeat to the question, the answer of which is I don't really know. Um, <laughs> so it's it's unclear whether if you have whether whether blueberry plants can be more or less attractive to bees given their soil quality. Um, I've not seen people who do that. Um, uh, again, one of the most interesting factoids I know of that comes from this guy named Lee Richardson who. Um, it, yeah, who is this Lee Richard's name? Uh, he took a lot of blueberry plants and he inoculated half of them with this um, soil fungus. It's called mycorrhizal fungi and they help plants get nutrients out of the soil. And 
Blueberries have a very weird group of those that only they use, and he thought that maybe they weren't everywhere blueberries were, so he complained. So he added them, and sure enough, the flowers got bigger and deeper and more full of nectar, and bees came and stayed longer on those flowers. So it seems like he helped those bushes get nutrients out of the soil by being associated with these fungi that he, asked, that he added, and it made them more attractive to bees. So having said, I don't know, there's this one little glimmer of information we have that if the soil gets better, then the, bee, the flowers get more attractive to bees. Whether that becomes a yield effect that is actually um, pays off for the farmer is actually the topic of one of the USDA grants that we may never get. Um, but it'd be great to find out. So maybe just a couple more questions. Um, I have yet to hear a mention of um, what I think might be possibly the greatest way to secure the future of these pollinators, and that is, um, in my mind, it's not with the population here tonight, but it's by teaching reverence to the kids who are the knee height on up to love and understand and and get you know the importance of these things and such a great population to work with. Do you have are there programs, are there things in the works, resources for working with young kids in schools? Because we are we are in the mantra after all. So So yeah. I'll, I'll start and give you a so, so yes, there are, and there's actually been several really impressive ones in my view. One of them, again, is through the Xerces Society, that's X-E-R-C-E-S, Xerces. It's, it's this fantastic NGO. Other ones conserve elephants and giraffes and wildlife. This is an NGO only about invertebrate conservation. They try to conserve all the stuff that is not so good at that. So they have a K-12 whole section. Um, there's also something called the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, NAPSI. Uh, and they have several by now really cool K-12 kind of curricula sets. Um, you can go net your own bees. There's um, a program where you can get um, sunflower seeds sent to you, and you grow them, and there's a protocol for discounting bees, and that August citizen science together into this national database of how pollinators do in the one spot. So those two, NAPSI and Cerces, are a gateway to several of the things you're looking for. Um, I've borrowed from them to go to my own kids' classes, and they're big hits, uh, really fun. I'm going to jump in on that one. Sure. So, how are some programs are mostly environmental ed, starting with preschoolers up through eighth grade, so the preschoolers study insects, there's another thing. Uh, you know, first figures spend the whole day in the woods getting connected to nature. So the pro may not be specific on pollinators, but how do we make sure that kids grow a stewardship in a mother land? And I think that's a starting point. Uh, and then specific to this program, uh, with, with a little bit of, of uh, support <coughs> from Barbara and her crew, is on um, July 15th will be a insect day that focuses on pollinators. And there's also separate stuff, but those are a couple of things. There are many of the schools and the program that I've been working on, so those students working on these jobs will be learning a lot. Right, right. I think part of this program is getting schools that you saw on the list into the pollinators are in peace. How are we doing on time? And real quick, I, I also want to um, repeat something that Taylor said in the very beginning of his talk, of his talk and that is that uh, pollinators are really having a moment right now, and I think a lot of people are starting to pay attention to that. And that is transferring to schools, and kids are getting interested in it. And there's a lot of online resources as well. Um, there's a place called Bumblebee Watch. This is things that you can do with your entire family. You know, you go online, you, you input where you saw a bumblebee, you, you upload your photograph, and there are people that can help you identify what species of bumblebee that is. Right here, we've got um, iNaturalist in the Vermont Atlas of Life, and so you can go online, and this is, this is not just for pollinators, but again, this is something that the entire family can get involved with. Um, there you go, there's eButterfly, there's iNaturalist, there's Vermont eBird. These are all things you can do with your entire family. These are online resources where you upload a photograph, and then the entire community of naturalists will get together and they'll say, yeah, I think that's a such and such species, or I think that isn't such and such species. And so you get a lot of input from the community. In, in taking advantage of these online resources. 
And then I would just say that because there's this mysterious guy, Lee Richardson, that we keep talking about, <laughs> um, he's, he's like a superhero. And he's might even just buzz in or something, but he's actually got a really good field guide he did to the bumblebees of North America. Um, check it out. It's really awesome. So that can get you going on IDing the bumblebees in your garden. We probably should call a halt now because uh, time's getting off. Thanks, everybody. Here.